This is the 45th Barcelona School of Economics lecture, so we have quite a long way. And uh, we have been uh, working with these lectures along with Bank Sabadell for all these years. So the first thing is I want to thank Bank Sabadell for supporting Barcelona School of Economics since the very beginning. And we have Sofia Rodriguez here, who is the chief economist of Bank Sabadell that is representing the, uh, the bank. And then uh, we will have Barbara Rossi, who is a, an affiliated professor and ICREA professor at UPF, been very many years with us already. So uh, she will do the profile of our invited speaker, Lucrecia Reislin, which is uh, not only the first time that she gives a lecture with us, but I also am very happy to, uh, to have Lucrecia in the Scientific Council. She uh, became a member um, recently, last year actually, and uh, this is also uh, something important for us, not only her presence here as a lecturer, but also because we count with her support uh, for all the other actions that we do at BSE. So that's all, and thank you. Sophia, you can go. It's a great pleasure to welcome Professor Raitlin, full professor of economics at uh, London Business School. Thank you, Lucrezia, for participating in the 45th edition of the Barcelona School of, uh, of Economics Lecture Series. Uh, I would also like to thank uh, Teresa, Barbara Rossi, uh, professors of Barcelona School of Economics, and all of you students and members of the academia. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for being here with Banco Sabedel this afternoon. In a moment, I will hand you over to Barbara, who will introduce Professor Leichlin. But first, let me say a few words to present the topic of today's lecture. Inflation has erupted in the economic arena after COVID with full force and underlying complexity, since the factors spurring it are diverse and difficult to reverse. Not only have we faced a sequence of supply shocks, including a cutoff of natural gas in Europe, but also we've seen demand disruptions since COVID created a big shift in consumption preferences and saving patterns. Moreover, the digital and sustainability transitions add to the difficulty in judging where the long-term supply curve is. Against this backdrop, it's hardly surprising that economic authorities are having trouble when deploying measures, both monetary and fiscal. It's not only that inflation has become more volatile and difficult to predict. Moreover, the unraveling of all the expansionary measures, both monetary and fiscal, that have been adopted along the last years is not elementary. Actually, to a certain extent, we might even say that monetary policy and fiscal policy are competing with each other. Not only economic authorities are puzzled, are puzzled by inflation nowadays. We, economic practitioners, and actually the financial world at large, is trying to make sense of and shed some light on this conundrum. Luckily, we can count with a tradition of far-reaching academic study related to inflation, among which Professor Rachelin's work are, are at the forefront. So it's a privilege to have Lucrecia here this afternoon. I am really looking forward to hearing your insights on inflation and monetary policy. So thank you very much again, Lucrecia, for being here. And Barbara, the floor is yours. Um, okay, um, I am uh, really delighted to introduce uh, Ru Lucrezia Reiklin. Uh, it is really fantastic to have you here, Lucrezia. Lucrezia is a professor of economics at the London Business School, a trustee of the Center for European Policy Research and the International Financial Reporting Standards Foundation. She is a columnist for the Italian National Daily Il Corriere della Sera and a regular contribut contributor of a project syndicate. Lucrezia received her PhD in economics from uh, New York University, and uh, since then uh, she has been the Director General of Research at the European Central Bank, a professor at the Université Libre de Bruxelles, a chair of the uh, Scientific Council of the Think Tank Bruegel, and she's a fellow of the Econometric Society, the British Academy, the European Economic Association, and a honorary fellow of the American Economic Association. Um, she is also on the advisory board of uh, several research and policy institutions uh, among the world. 
Um, Lucrezia has also been an active contributor to the life of the CEPR. Uh, Lucrezia has published uh, numerous uh, papers uh, and, uh, on econometrics and macroeconomics. She is an expert on forecasting, monetary policy, business cycle analysis, and the factor models. She pioneered the now casting in economics by developing econometric methods capable of reading the real-time data flow through the lenses of formal econometric models. These methods are now widely used by central banks and private investors around the world. I have known Lucrezia for many years, and in fact, she might not remember that she was my professor at the master program where she taught me time series econometrics. <laughs> And uh, since then, uh, I met uh, Lucrezia in many professional meetings uh, where she not only presented cutting-edge uh, research, but also offered to participate in, in mentoring programs uh, and has been a really a role model, not just for me, but for several generations uh, of uh, female uh, researchers. One of the features I admire the most in Lucrezia's work is her ability to answer substantive uh, economic questions and not shy away from contributing to provocative debates. And today her talk uh, is uh, an example. The title of the talk uh, is uh, Inflation and Disinflation Puzzles. Um, and uh, Lucrezia, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you for being here. Thank you very much. I didn't know I was your professor, <laughs> but, uh, you know, this is my white hair. That, uh, uh, anyway, it's a pleasure to be here, especially because uh, I'm, uh, I just become a member of the, of the Advisory Council, Scientific Council, and uh, so that's a way, you know, to get to know you. Um, I was a little bit uncertain on what to present, so uh, I actually have two different presentations, but I probably only present the first half, okay? So let's see how it goes. Uh, so uh, it is, you know, the idea is to present a body of work with different approaches to try to understand some of the puzzles related to the recent inflation and disinflation uh, episodes. Um, and so uh, in the first part of the talk, where I would like to, to spend most, most of the time, I will actually present uh, a, a report that I co-authored with Veronica Guerrieri from Chicago Booth, Michaela Marcusen, who is a chief economist of Societe Generale, and Silvana Teneiro of uh, LSE, and uh, you know, just stepped out from, uh, from the Monetary Poli Policy Committee at the Bank of England, in which we take a contrarian view about what's going on with inflation and monetary policy, so it's the most dovish uh, uh, report that then uh, has ever been written. Somebody said that this is what happens when you ask four women to write a report, and then they come up with something completely, you know, crazy. Okay, so that's what I would like to present this report. I mean, it's a mix of policy and uh, actually formal work. Uh, and then in the second part, if we have time, uh, I would like to present some of my recent work uh, on, uh, on the Phillips curve. And um, the reason uh, these are kind of related uh, issues is because if we're talking about puzzles, uh, um, you know, there is not only you know, the puzzle of why inflation is, uh, has um, been so persistent, uh, which is one of the things monetary policy, is, uh, monetary policy officials are struggling with, but also what happened to the Phillips curve? It was supposed to be flat, and now all of a sudden uh, it seems that it's almost vertical, so it seems that you know, the empirical research in macroeconomics uh, is kind of bankrupt uh, in, in that field. And so you know, in the second part, if I have time, I'll try to you know, give you my view on uh, how to make sense of some of the correlations in the data. So uh, the, mm, let me start for the first part, okay, and, and give you a motivation. So uh, there were two views when inflation first manifested itself in 2021. Uh, the first view was this is a temporary supply shock. So, you know, the textbook macroeconomics uh, tells you if it's a temporary supply shock, just the monetary policy should look through and just wait until it goes, okay? And the second view was the opposite. This is actually a lot is demand. And um, so when you're faced with a demand shock, monetary policy has to respond aggressively. Uh, to avoid persistence, to avoid secondary effects, second round effect with wage catching up uh, and then expectations, uh, you know, getting this anchor. Uh, now, 
uh, the common wisdom at this point, you know, almost two years uh, after this happened, is that the first view was wrong, okay? So this is actually, uh, having relied on that first view, what explains the hesitation of central bankers uh, at the beginning uh, uh, of the inflation uh, episode. And, um, and this is also based on the observation that core inflation, so that part of inflation which is stripped by, you know, oil and, you know, more volatile components, uh, uh, has been very persistent, okay? So, because then, you know, the, 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 f the first view was killed and the second view prevailed, then central bankers were nuts, and then they went through a very, uh, you know, uh, significant uh, monetary policy tightening. So, it's like they, there is a form of penitence here. It's like they were so much accused about being late that now they're really going very strongly. So our report uh, takes a, a different view. I mean, we try, we push a third explanation, and uh, we are trying to analyze uh, both uh, through some empirical work and through the lenses of a simple model what happens when uh, uh, a temporary supply shocks, uh, which is uneven because uh, you know it's uh, it was related to energy or maybe so supply uh, supply chain disruptions. So what happens uh, w through the input-output structure of the economy, through the sectoral propagation, okay, what happened, you know, through the sectors? And uh, we show that actually this propagation through, because of price rigidity and input-output chains, uh, can create persistence, exactly the type of persistence that uh, um, oh, persists on underlying inflation. So even when the original shock uh, fades out, uh, core inflation remains persistent. And, um, and so this is uh, actually, and, and the transmission uh, is uh, really via the good market rather than the labor market. So the emphasis on wages uh, is misplaced. And uh, this analysis, I will argue, will matters. Uh, uh, I mean, so the implication of this analysis, there is some normative implication, is that in these conditions, aggressive monetary policy may actually be damaging. Uh, because uh, it actually uh, impedes the relative price movement in the economy to work, okay? So, and this analysis matters especially for the Euro area where um, the role of demand was weaker than in the US, so that that kind of representation of the inflation process uh, is, is more, is closer to the data. Prices are more rigid, so therefore, you know, persistence. And then uh, the shocks, the energy shocks, is not only a supply shocks, but also is a negative shock on the terms of trades because Europe uh, is not uh, uh, an oil producer, is a net importer, so an oil shock uh, is also a, a shock in, the, in, in, uh, in, uh, in real income, and so it makes the Europeans poorer, okay? So it's, it's also negative on demand. Okay, so let me start on, uh, on, the, on the first part. And uh, I will just give you some stylized data, okay? Some stylized fact I think is always useful to ground uh, uh, and, uh, you know, any analysis from the observation of the data. And, uh, you know, let me just first uh, look at the first part. So inflation, and then I will look at disinflation, okay? So where do we come from? Uh, so there are four key facts. Well, first of all, that the, the supply shocks was big. Second, that it was coupled with a large change in relative prices. Third, that, uh, you know, terms of trade was negative in Europe. Uh, and, uh, you know, as a consequence, uh, uh, you know, the private investment and consumptions uh, have been much weaker in Europe than in the United States. So this is uh, the first uh, fact. Here you have on the left inside, uh, on this here, you have... Uh, uh, oil price, then you have gas price just uh, for the last part of the samples, you have the euro area inflation, and uh, then you have the US inflation here. Here I'm just zooming, and the zoom is here to just tell you that uh, if you go from trough to peak, uh, this shock uh, has been larger than the shock that we have experienced uh, in the late 70s and early 80s. So basically, take away from this chart, the shock is big. Uh, now, this is also, uh, this is another way of looking at uneven supply shocks. This is, a, um, this is a global supply chain pressure index as constructed by the Federal Reserve Bank of New York. You can see that, uh, you know, big shock and then, okay, so that then kind of reversed. 
Uh, now, second fact, uh, uh, relative price changes. Here you have the, the standard deviation of sectoral prices. Uh, you have the sectoral component of PPI, the sectoral component of CPI. Uh, I mean, the other stuff, uh, just forget about it, but you can see now that the standard deviation has been uh, climbing up, uh, and uh, uh, you know, this is uh, a measure of uh, you know, changes in relative prices. Here you have just the zoom of, uh, of this chart, okay, for the, for the most recent period. Now, third, uh, third fact, uh, these are the terms of trades uh, for the U.S. and for the euro area, so positive for the U.S. Uh, and negative for the euro area, although now reversing. And, uh, you know, this is uh, the observation I gave you at the, at the beginning, so that, uh, you know, this is also negative on demand. Um, now, if we uh, just look at data without much of, uh, you know, pretending of establishing any causation, but you can see that, uh, you know, consumption uh, behave very differently in the euro area than in the U.S. Um, here you have, uh, uh, you know, here is uh, the last quarter, 2019, May 200, uh, and this is the pre-2019 trend. You see that uh, uh, consumption uh, in the euro area has not been back, while it has been back in the U.S., even more dramatic uh, is the investment picture, where you have been, uh, you know, we have had, uh, notwithstanding all these European programs, uh, we have had a collapse of investment in Europe. And, uh, of course, uh, the same, you know, is obviously true for GDP. Okay, so uh, these are the facts with this, I mean, and I want to, uh, you to, to keep these four facts in mind because um, because this, these four facts, then I will try to then describe them through the lenses of a model. Now, let's look at uh, what happened as a consequence. So what monetary policy did uh, went through massive tightenings, okay? So this is actually not uh, updated to the last uh, increase of interest rate by the ECB, but just the, 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 the increase before the last. But uh, you see how this, uh, you know, very rapid increase of the policy rate uh, in both jurisdictions, okay, with the ECB uh, getting there a little bit later, but, uh, you know, more or less than, uh, you know, catching up. And, uh, and this is inflation. Here you have, uh, uh, you know, the, the first uh, concern of central bankers, or puzzle, if you want, that... You know, as a cons you know, as, uh, you know, as a consequence uh, of, of uh, interest rate increase, but also as a consequence of the fact that the original shock was fading, as we have seen from the other charts, inflation actually started going down quite rapidly. And you see, you can see that from the euro area and both for, for the U.S. Okay, so that uh, you know they, uh, you know, they massively go down, but core inflation remains quite persistent. Okay. Uh, so, and this is actually, I mean, this is actually the core of, of, of our analysis because this is what central bankers are worrying about. Whereas they are worrying about that, that uh, this uh, high core will kind of get entrenched. And, uh, and so this is why they, they haven't finished their job, okay? So uh, as they have communicated. Now, if you look in historical perspective, uh, however, this episode of disinflation, and here I have in a solid line gray the last episode in the U.S. and the dash is, is the euro area, while here you have the 73, 76 disinflation, and here you have the Volcker disinflation. So inflation has been going down much more rapidly than uh, in the previous uh, episodes. And this is significant because I'm sure that anybody of you who has studied macroeconomics, you know, the Volcker disinflation is kind of a benchmark. Uh, you know, this guy came and then uh, conquered the U.S. inflation and so on. And we are going much, much stronger than Volcker, okay? And you can see that also from this uh, picture for the U.S., okay, where you have the whole historical analysis, the federal funds rate and the inflation rate. So that this is Volcker here. So it went down, but very gradually, okay? So the actual inflation stayed between 3.5 and 4% until the end of the 90s, okay? So he didn't, uh, he didn't aim at going at 2% like in two years, okay? So this is what we are seeing now is unprecedented, okay? It's something really new. Okay, so two uh, more features about, uh, uh, about uh, this... Uh, 
this inflation and inflation, which are puzzling uh, for some analysts, is that uh, we haven't seen uh, um, that, first of all, that we have seen a very tight labor market, but actually wages have not picked up, okay? So there hasn't been the typical wage price spiral, which is also textbook, uh, and that, uh, you know, typically, you know, economists, when they think about, uh, you know, how inflation propagates, they think about the labor market more than the good market. Uh, now, Bernanke and Blanchard, they, there is just a recent paper in which actually they document this, you know, extensively, and, you know, they also make the same observation, so I'm not going to go there. I mean, that's their analysis. But if you look at the ECB projections uh, also on the wage price spirals, uh, uh, in, uh, in, in, the, in the euro area, there, there isn't, uh, you know, uh, an expectation that there will be, um, you know, a, that kind of mechanism uh, working through the labor market. And this is a puzzle because the labor market is quite tight. The second puzzle is that even if inflation has been up, inflation expectations have been quite stable. And uh, uh, so it looks like that we are enjoying a credibility bonus that uh, we, uh, that, you know, was not enjo enjoyed in the 70s, okay? In the 70s, inflation expectations uh, got this anchor. Uh, if you look at medium term uh, uh, inflation expectations, uh, we can argue about the data. This uh, has not happened uh, this time, okay? So these are two features which are quite different of this uh, uh, inflation episode. Now, uh, let me just go, uh, okay, so these are uh, inflation expectation uh, for, uh, for the US. So this is a break even five years, break even five year, five year, this is from the Fed. Uh, this is the Cleveland Fed, five years. So these are different, uh, okay, different uh, uh, indicators of inflation expectations. Uh, the UOM is University of Michigan, five years ahead. This is consumer expectation. And then you see consumer expectation is typically more volatile, so there is something there, but that's actually, that's traditionally the case. But if you think, uh, if you take of other uh, indicators, consensus economic or break-even, which is market expectation, you can see that deflation is quite anchored. Uh, in the report, uh, we try to do a simple exercise. We look at the expected infl uh, inflation of several of these indicators. We try to decompose it uh, into a component uh, which is uh, driven by lag inflation, okay? So that's kind of the inertia component. And a component uh, which uh, is driven by a target where we put 2% uh, for, for, uh, for the great moderation period and 3% and, and for the Volcker period. Uh, uh, with these constraints, and then we try to see, you know, how, what is the dynamic of these two components. Uh, here, uh, when you use the Cleveland Fed, for example, here you, with consensus inflation, this is with the Cleveland Fed, you can see that, uh, you know, the acceleration component uh, actually went up uh, during the 2008 crisis because of deflation, okay? So that uh, there was there, you know, the danger of, uh, of the anchoring, uh, because of, of, of the financial crisis, um, uh, but, and, and uh, sorry, this is the, uh, I, I'm, I'm talking about the anchor component, it went down because of the, uh, of the, of the, you know, uh, expectations that inflation was going to go down massively because of the financial crisis, but actually has not moved that much, uh, as, much as much in this uh, uh, recent episode uh, and is now back, uh, you know, almost to one, okay? And the same, uh, actually, even more, this is true for, uh, for, uh, for the consensus inflation, five year, five year. This is just a way to represent the data. Um, this is the longer, uh, you know, with a longer sample. Also, you can see this in perspective, okay? So that uh, we haven't moved much with respect to how much uh, we were moving, uh, uh, you know, in the early 90s. And, uh, you know, this is a rolling, seven years rolling window from 1982 to 2023. Okay, so let's make sense of this fact with this very long uh, introduction. Um, and I will first uh, present uh, some econometric evidence, and then I will present a, a, a very stylized model. Okay, so the first uh, uh, econometric evidence I want to present uh, is evidence from a structural VAR analysis, 
where uh, we have uh, quite a rich information on sectoral inflation, interest rate and, uh, and real variables, but you know, the, the, the inflation component of the VR is quite detailed in, in, uh, in sectoral detail. And uh, we, we run two VRs, so one, uh, first of all, for the US, so the first exercise is to ask the question, is the sectoral transmission um, through prices different when you shock the VR with a supply shock, and uh, as a proxy for a supply shock, uh, we take an oil shock uh, and we do external instrument uh, high frequency identification uh, using uh, OPEC announcement, uh, um, you know, borrowing uh, uh, the, the data on OPEC announcement from a former student from London Business School who is now at Northwestern, it's called Diego Kanzig, who wrote a paper in which he um, collects this data on OPEC announcement that we use as instruments uh, to identify these exogenous uh, oil supply shocks. And then we look at the transmission of the oil supply shock through the sectors. And then we comparing, um, and this is, we call it an uneven shock, okay, because it just, uh, you know, hits one sector rather than all sectors. And then we compare the result uh, by looking at uh, what happens uh, to the same uh, uh, VR when we shock it by an even shock, so, and we take it as a proxy, a monetary policy shock. And uh, we identify the monetary policy shock uh, through the same methodology, so we use FOMC announcement, they use it uh, as external instrument, uh, and uh, which, you know, now kind of state-of-the-art uh, type of VR structural analysis. So you know, we do this for the US, we do from 79 to 2015. We stop at 2015 because we had to clean the shock using the green book and the green book are not available until, you know, so that this, is, this explains why we, we stop. But, you know, we, we are interested in, the, in characterizing historical behavior, okay, of um, the response. So um, let me first, uh, show you this picture. This is the, uh, this is the response to the oil shock. Um, it is actually, um, it is uh, uh, the response when negative oil supply shock, which increased the WTI price by $1, and the shaded areas uh, are 68, uh, 80, and 90% coverage ratios. Now, it's not very visible, I realize, but uh, what I want to, um, what I want to highlight is that, you know, there is a quite rich uh, lead lag uh, relationship. There are certain, uh, uh, you know, for example, transport, where is transport somewhere? Um, you know, I don't know. Okay, so uh, anyway, so, you know, fuels move first, the food moves later, manufacturing moves later, uh, shelter moves much later, so there is a lead lag relationship, okay, through sectors, okay, so that's, uh, and this is, turns out to be very important for our story. Uh, so, transport first, because they use oil immediately, then food, and then eventually shelter and services, and this is actually what explains also the, the lag behavior of core. Now, if we go to monetary, uh, so this is actually, uh, quantitatively is different because this is the, mm, is now, uh, it is, an, uh, is a negative monetary policy shock which increases the federal funds rate by 1%. Uh, but what is important here is the shape. And uh, we can see here that the shape are much more homogeneous uh, when the economy is hit by an even shock, so a demand shock, than what is even by a supply shock. I mean, to make it clear, here is this, uh, uh, this picture where I put everything together. Uh, the size doesn't matter. The, it, uh, everything is standardized, uh, but the, the size, uh, um, you know, you should compare size. You should just compare shapes. And what I want to emphasize is that the response of monetary policy, you see they're all clustered together, okay? So they're much more uh, homogeneous than the response to the oil shock. Okay, so that's, that's the first takeaway of this, of this analysis. Uh, so there is more heterogeneity in response to supply than in response to demand. Now, second exercise, uh, I, uh, the, uh, we want to compare the US and the Euro area. Why? 
because then in the model, we are going to argue that uh, what happens to the persistent uh, depends on the persistence of, of prices, on price rigidity, and in the euro area is well documented that prices are more rigid. And also, it happens, uh, so some of the features, uh, the drop in consumption and the drop in investment, uh, you know, depends on whether the, the economy is open or not open. And here is the, the, the issue of the terms of trade, uh, since the euro area is a, is a net importer of oil. So now this is, uh, um, you know, from, from, a, from a VR now, from a, from a sh shorter sample from 1997 to 2022, because uh, we were constrained with data for the euro area, uh, we have the exogenous, uh, so the response uh, to, to, a, to an oil supply shock. You see this is for the euro area, this is the oil price uh, uh, reacts immediately, the inflation rate uh, reacts with the lag, uh, and core inflation is even more lagging, but it's incredibly persistent. From the beginning of the first shock to, to, the, to the full absorption of the shock, it takes 60 months, so almost five years. Okay, so that's the... Um, and then, uh, uh, you know, if you compare the euro area and the U.S., uh, you see that there is more persistence in the U.S. than in the euro, in the euro area than in the U.S., okay? So, so this can, you, you know, these are the full results, but, you know, forget about uh, looking at that picture. But, I mean, the, 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 the takeaway is that uh, there is more persistent uh, in the euro area uh, than in the U.S., and... Um, Although, you know, there is, uh, you know, the feature of heterogeneity and this kind of these different waves of inflation, uh, it is actually, uh, you know, uh, in both, in, in both economies. Okay. Uh, okay. Now let's get to the model and um, we'll try to take, you know, to make sense uh, of this model. This is not a quantitative model, so it's not a, uh, a DSG with, uh, you know, it's just a, you know, pen and pencil and, uh, you know, to try to see whether, you know, we can actually replicate this fact with something relatively reasonable. Uh, okay, so uh, this is a, uh, why, I mean, first of all, I mean, uh, let me summarize the key fact again before I, I get into the model. So from the VR, we have seen that oil price shocks generate more sector of price heterogeneity than demand shock, okay? European response to oil shocks is delayed and more persistent relative to the US. And then from the descriptive evidence at the beginning, I showed that Europe and the US experience opposite terms of trade dynamics. So the terms of trade deteriorate in Europe and improve in the US. And the European private demand has recovered more slowly than in the US, okay? Now, this model, I'm not gonna go through the equations, uh, but uh, you know, the main mechanism of this model, I'm going to show you just a couple of, of key slides. Uh, is that the supply shocks uh, that hit different sector differently in this model generates lags waved of sectoral inflation, which makes uh, the aggregate uh, response of inflation persistent. And the key is the transmission mechanism depends on the input output uh, structure of the economy, which here is captured by the two sector. Okay, so that's very simple. And, uh, um, and then on, on, on sectoral price thickness. So is a you know, stylized two-sector new Keynesian model with nominal rigidities uh, where the key thing is that energy affects directly the production of one sector, which for us is the production B. Oops. So this is, you have two sectors. This is B, let's say manufacturing, okay? So that, uh, you know, this is a production uh, is affected by labor. And then Z, which is oil, okay? while A, which is the service sector, gets, uh, you, know, is, uh, you know, is affected by labor, of course, and uh, by, by, the, uh, by X, which are the good produced by the B sectors. So it gets the fat of oil, but only indirectly because, it, because it, it uses manufacturing as an input, okay? And, uh, okay, so, uh, so, I mean, this is all familiar, it's all very, very standard. This is a CES aggregator and, and uh, you know, and, and, and in the model, uh, this is a model with wage rigidity, uh, with, uh, sorry, with uh, price rigidity and wage flexibility, although we have an extension also with wage rigidity, so where prices are set uh, a la caldo, okay? 
And uh, we are, for the moment, uh, uh, assuming that labor is fully mobile across sectors, but uh, you know, we also have an extension where we look at what happens when labor is not fully mobile. Um, now, um, so uh, in the model, there is a fixed, a domestic fixed supply of oil, which is uh, sold at a given price. Um, and then there is a fully elastic supply of oil uh, produced abroad uh, and sold at a certain price. Uh, and then, the, the, you know, the, the economy trades goods for oil. And, uh, you know, uh, as I said, it's the model is simple, so we assume financial autarky and um, et cetera. Okay, but the key thing, so do I say skip, skip? But the, the, the key thing here is what happened, uh, uh, is this sacral Phillips curve, because here from this, uh, you can actually see what's going on uh, when I will show you the charts. Okay, so there are two sectoral Phillips curve, okay, that, uh, you know, that capture the face of optimal stagger price, uh, price setting. I mean, this is uh, uh, the sectoral inflation. It depends on, uh, uh, you know, on, on lag inflation, and here there is a, an inertia parameters. Uh, and then uh, it depends, of course, by the difference between the marginal cost of the, of the sector and the price of the sector. And, um, okay, and this, uh, uh, and this lambda here, uh, you know, uh, is, the, is the degree of price thickness uh, in the sector. And so the marginal cost is specific uh, to the sectors. Uh, so, due to the stickiness, the nominal price uh, uh, of, um, of uh, you know, they, they adjust only, in a, in a, you know, they adjust only gradually, okay? Uh, so, as the price level in sector B, which is uh, our manufacturing sector, so is, uh, increases, uh, you know, as a consequence of oils, this increases the, marginal, uh, the, ma the nominal marginal cost in the service sector. Uh, because uh, this good B is used as an input uh, in the sector A, okay? So this implies that the price response in the service sector is delayed, okay? So this is the delay effect that we want to capture. And, uh, and this actually is what generates uh, that persistent of aggregate inflation that we have seen in the data, okay? So it's these kind of waves uh, of, uh, of price increases through sectors that, uh, that generate that persistent. Um, Okay, so, uh, and of course, uh, you know, here uh, you have, you know, the marginal, the marginal cost of the two sectors, which, uh, you know, here they depend, uh, this depends on the price of B, as I said, and this is a price of Z, which is, which is oil, and then, of course, wages. Okay, so um, in this here, I mean, I will show you the, um, what happens uh, in, in, in the, through the charts. So this is the mechanism, um, and this is uh, uh, how the economy reacts to an oil price shock, uh, assuming that the central banks uh, is keeping employment uh, fixed, okay? So this is like, uh, you can think of this as a, as a stabilizing central bank. And uh, so in dash line, you have the flexible price equilibrium, and uh, in blue, you have, uh, uh, you know, the, the you know, the, the equilibrium that results from the, this kind of monetary policy and the stickiness in the, on the model. So um, we, we, uh, what happened here, uh, which is, uh, um, what happened here is that uh, you, you can see that there is quite a lot of heterogeneity, uh, you know, that's the driven by, you know, the model that I described. So this is total inflation. But, uh, uh, you know, this is uh, uh, the inflation in sector B, which increases immediately because of, of, the, uh, because, of the, um, because of the oil. And then uh, inflation A, which doesn't increase immediately, but is persistent. Uh, and uh, you can see that uh, this is the difference between the relative price uh, of, sector, uh, uh, of sector B uh, with respect to what would happen in, uh, you know, in a perfectly flexible price equilibrium. And, uh, and here is sector of consumption, and you see that consumption, uh, when, uh, uh, when employment uh, is kept constant, uh, goes down, uh, you know, this is just the effect uh, uh, of, of monetary policy being uh, relatively uh, uh, easy with respect to the flexible price equilibrium, consumption goes uh, down less. But I mean, the important thing, the important two pictures here is this middle, 
uh, these intermediate ones because you know these show you this uh, kind of relative price effect and uh, and the persistence. Okay, so this is uh, uh, the, so the input structure is the uh, input output uh, uh, mechanism is the main channel of transmission. And uh, another important transmission occurs through the labor market because you also have wages in, the, in, the, in, the, in, in, in those uh, Phillips curve. But uh, as I said, in the, in the current version of the model, uh, wages are fully flexible. Or we are, if you look at the report, we look also what happens if, uh, if, if, you, if, if, if you include some rigidity and the mechanism is just amplified, okay? So if you have... Uh, uh, so to sum up, the persistent effect of inflation uh, is the effect of the uneven effect on oil prices in the two sectors combined with price stickiness. Uh, and this implies that the degree of price stickiness in the economy and the degree of substitutability between the two goods and between different factors of production are key parameters uh, of the model that, inflation, that affect inflation dynamic. Okay, so uh, uh, let me just get, then get to uh, uh, the second exercise, which in, uh, we try to, to now to have the same economy, the same shock, but uh, with uh, different deg degrees of price stickiness, okay? So here you have the euro area, uh, with the, you know, which uh, we know that uh, you know, micro evidence uh, uh, you know, says that uh, there is more price stickiness. And here you have the, U the US. So the mechanism is exactly the same, but you know you can see that inflation uh, here. This is total inflation. Is uh, you know it, it, it increases less at the beginning, but is more persistent. Okay, so you know this is uh, actually quite uh, obvious from the structure of the model that you can generate this uh, persistent. Uh, so this is the second exercise. Uh, then you know there are other exercises uh, that uh, uh, that we show that when labor is a better substitute for oil and so on. But I will skip that to get to the main point and present a third uh, sorry a third exercise, um, which is uh, uh, sorry this was the change of price signal. So this is my third exercise in which I compare uh, the oil shock with the monetary policy shock. And here I want to mimic uh, what I found in the VRs. And exactly what you can see here is that uh, in, um, when, uh, when I shock uh, the, the model with an aggregate demand shock, which is an increase in aggregate consumption that generates the same increase in, tot in total inflation on impact as the oil shock, you can see that uh, uh, you know, there is less heterogeneity that uh, you, we have seen in the oil shock, okay? So this is what also came out on the VR. Um, so, uh, okay, there is some heterogeneity, of course, uh, because uh, oil respond to monetary policy. So to the extent that oil respond to monetary policy or to demand shocks, then this also you know, transmits heterogeneously through the economy, but this is a, a, an indirect effect, it's not a direct effect. So then a fourth exercise is trying to look at normative implication, okay? So what should monetary policy be in this type of environment? So should the monetary policy stance be the same as when the economy is hit by demand shock, an even shock, or not? And uh, um, so to, to address this issue, we look at the response of the economy to the same oil shock as the, oil shock as, as the previous exercise, but assuming that in each period after the shock, employment is equal to the employment level in the flexible price level uh, version of the model. Um, so um, this can be thought as a case in which monetary policy is tight, okay? So it, uh, you know, it's designed so as to replicate the flexible price equilibrium. And uh, so in the next, uh, in this chart, uh, I am showing, uh, uh, you know, this, monetary policy here, where, uh, uh, you know, um, this is a, so this is a monetary policy shock, no, sorry, <laughs> okay. So, uh, so this now employment is not kept constant by the monetary authorities anymore, but it, it goes, uh, uh, you know, it mimics uh, the employment uh, that uh, should result from the flexible price equilibrium. And, uh, you know, what you see here, is uh, uh, what you see here. So we compare, you know, these are two types of monetary policy. So you can think that this is a, is a loose monetary policy because employment is kept constant uh, and this is tight. Um, 
Now, the tight monetary policy generates a trade-off. So you see that the inflation is, doesn't rise at all. Inflation is flat. So, um, but uh, there is very little movement uh, in relative prices with respect to the flexible price equilibrium, okay? So relative prices move too little, okay? As a, w as a result of that, uh, welfare uh, drops more with uh, a tight monetary policy than with loose monetary policy. Now, in the log linearized uh, uh, version of the model, you see that consumption is the same. So you may think that I am just uh, talking nonsense here, but this is a technical reason when you do, uh, you know, the, uh, you know, when you try to compute, compute the welfare loss, uh, you, you can see in our paper that actually there is quite a large welfare loss as a consequence of these relative prices uh, moving too little. And uh, um, so, oh, so basically, um, so in, in uh, um, so the, the idea is that the tight monetary policy, by containing inflationary pressures, uh, reduces the relative price adjustment that you need, uh, you know, to, to for the economy, you know, to adjust uh, to obtain the, the right reallocation. So there is not enough reallocation to our service. Uh, and uh, this is the mechanism that reduces welfare. So the normative implication here is that uh, some inflation is actually good, okay? So that it helps oil in the wheel and getting the relative price mechanism uh, to work through the economy. And uh, okay, uh, so this is the, 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 the fourth exercise. And now in the fifth exercise, uh, we try to compute uh, uh, the uh, closed economy uh, and to compare the closed economy uh, to the open economy, where the open economy can be taken to be the euro area. And uh, um, we uh, shock now with oil in both cases. And uh, basically here, um, uh, to capture the different uh, patterns of terms to trade uh, between the euro area and the US, uh, um, I mean, we consider uh, the energy price shock as an increase in the foreign oil price. Um, so, and then we assume that uh, uh, the economy imports oil from abroad uh, on top of a fixed supply of oil, and then uh, uh, it exchanges oil for manufacturing goods. Um, and then uh, when we, here we assume an increase in foreign oil price that generates uh, the same increase in domestic oil prices as the one generated by reducing supply in the closed economy so that we can actually uh, compare. And, uh, you know, the big difference uh, from the open economy and the closed economy uh, is that consumption uh, here uh, drops uh, much more in the open economy. This corresponds to, to the, those, uh, this is the uh, consumption drops much more than in the closed economy. And this is uh, basically because of the terms of trade effect, okay? From this, this is like an exchange rate effect, essentially, okay? So that, uh, which makes, uh, uh, you know, the Europeans poorer, okay? Because, uh, because they're importing oil. And uh, this corresponds to those charts uh, that, uh, that we have seen. Uh, okay. Um, so this is, this is actually, is, is, the, uh, is the end of, uh, of, uh, of this kind of, uh, of uh, my model. Now, if we, if we put everything together, um, we can actually, I want to get to the conclusion of, of this one before I get to, to talk about other things. And uh, so uh, let's try to put everything together. So uh, first of all, I gave you some stylized fact. Then I gave you some VR-based evidence, uh, which shows some features, some stylized features, but a little bit more structural. And then I gave you a very simple model that could reproduce both uh, the, the simple descriptive evidence uh, and the econometric evidence. Uh, and uh, in a way, I mean, you can think of this uh, work as complementary to a certain extent to, to the recent paper of Bernanke uh, Aldo, uh, and Blanchard, although, you know, we work independently, because they start by the observation and they, uh, and they try to quantify that, that this time, uh, you know, inflation was not driven by labor market uh, mechanism, was not driven by wages, but is a good market type of inflation. And, uh, and our effort here is to tell you, say, okay, but if it's good market, how does it work, okay? And in order to make it 
to, make, to, to build the story, you need this kind of sector heterogeneity and you need price rigidity. And, uh, and then, you know, there is the nuances of the open and closed economy and so on. But, you know, the main mechanism is this sector of Phillips curves uh, and, uh, you know, this input-output structure where one sector gets the oil increase directly and the, another sector gets the input only indirectly. Um, so, oh, this, uh, uh, so we show how propagation of an event shocks in the good market generate persistent uh, and uh, also uh, the, the, uh, our stories explains the difference between the US and the euro area. And I think at the end, there are three main arguments uh, for cautions in monetary policy decisions. Uh, uh, the first one is that uh, you don't want to kill inflation too fast because you want relative prices to, to do their work to favor reallocation in the economy through sectors. Um, and you know, this is the main mechanism. Uh, now, it is true that I just presented this together with Blanchard the other day, and he's much more hawkish than me because he says, well, maybe we haven't seen it coming, but maybe in the US now there will be wage pressure, and it's just that this is all about lags. Well, I don't know. I mean, this is outside the scope of this presentation, but. Uh, you know, the same argument about lies can also be made by the current uh, monetary policy tightness uh, that, uh, you know, the effect of monetary policy haven't been uh, uh, felt yet in the economy. And, uh, you know, because the monetary policy act with the lags. And uh, um, so, but we explain, uh, so it, is, it, it might be possible, you know, coming, but, uh, but then and the, the, the third important feature is that, uh, you know, we haven't seen it so far, wages, and we haven't seen the anchor of expectations. So if you want to build the story of inflation and disinflation, because inflation is actually decreasing now quite rapidly, but core is still quite sticky, you need to have a story of that mechanism which does not rely on wages and does not rely on expectations, okay? And this is a story, so I gave you a story. There might be other stories, but this is one story. Uh, so this is my conclusion on this, uh, on this report. There are other things on the report, but, you know, that's the, the main story. Uh, I think, I don't know if I have more time, but uh, um, I do? Okay, so because I, I was, uh, okay. So then if I do, I, uh, I can say, tell you something about uh, some uh, related research, uh, purely now econometric research uh, now, and this is work with the uh, other set of co-authors, uh, um, and which is about revisiting the evidence on the Phillips curve. It is related because actually, uh, you know, in the current debate, uh, uh, it has been, uh, uh, you know, so, so the idea that the Phillips curve was flat was very much in all the, the econometric evidence, a lot of research on that. And actually, central bankers that sometimes believe in what researchers do, they say, well, the Phillips curve is flat, so let's, let's leave it, okay? So let's, do, let's have inflation do their course. So then the question is, um, is, infl is the Phillips curve really flat or not? So uh, I build my reputation as an economist as a, as a kind of reduced form uh, econometrician, uh, which is like a low form of life uh, in economics. But uh, so I wanted to, you know, just take a, a very, you know, kind of reduced form view. I mean, although informed a little bit by some, some model, to try to see what is robust, okay, about the relationship between inflation and, uh, and economic activity. And, uh, you know, the first survey, inflation is a very hard uh, variable to model and especially a very hard mod uh, variable to forecast. Uh, and for various reasons. First of all, inflation is trending, is trend. So this is like the rate of change. But, uh, uh, you know, if you take infl inflation data, you know, you have trends that uh, actually dominate the volatility. But also, you know, there are also periods of high volatility. Uh, here you have an employment rate and inflation rate. You see that the, the, it seems that the relationship between inflation and unemployment is not stable, okay? So there are episodes, I'm just circling here too, in which, uh, you know, the two variables seems to go, you know, on their own way. Now, if you add oil here, the situation becomes even worse, okay? Because, uh, uh, you know, 
Oil, of course, is correlated with inflation, but you know, you can have spikes of oil which do not translate in inflation. And uh, you know, the relationship between oil and inflation seems to be unstable as well, okay? So this poses all kind of modeling issues uh, and uh, um, which, you know, I, I just, I mean, I don't want to, I mean, I, I, this is not a full talk about this. I just wanted to use some, uh, to show you some key results. So first of all, you know, you have to understand the trends. Second, uh, you have to extract some kind of uh, denoise uh, cycle through this data that can uh, identify the correlation between the real economy and, uh, and, uh, and inflation. This is what uh, the Phillips curve is about. And, um, and for that, uh, um, okay, the, the VR, VR analysis is not a very good tool because you, know, you cannot disentangle well trend from stationary component, from cyclical component. And uh, so what we have been using in, in a bunch of paper that uh, a couple are published, but there is a, uh, we have some research in progress, uh, is to use a structural time series model that uh, decompose uh, the time series uh, in uh, trend and cycles. These are multivariate models in which uh, uh, we make some uh, uh, identifying assumptions, uh, partly informed by minimal uh, uh, economic, uh, economic theory, but uh, very little. Uh, in order to have a parsimonious representation of uh, inflation, employment, unemployment, interest rate in a multivariate model in which we decompose trends from cycle. So I'm going to show you some data, if you do that, uh, on more than 100 years of data. Um, and first of all, uh, I mean, th this is now uh, the full model, but just to give you a flavor of what kind of model uh, we are talking about. So let's say that uh, uh, you know, this, this is the economy, let's say output. So output uh, we can, can be represented by a trend, which is uh, you know, driven by technology, whatever, and then an output gap. And the trend, you can, uh, you, you, you have to make some assumption about what the trend is like. So if you, uh, you know, you, you know when the assumption that you can make here is that the trend is a random walk, for example. And then uh, the gap uh, is some kind of stationary component. And you make some assumptions about the time series feature of this stationary component. And, um, and then you say that unemployment uh, is, will have its own trend plus will be a function uh, of the output gap because through the Okun law, unemployment will be correlated with output. Uh, then you can see that the, the nominal variables, so the, here is inflation, they will have a trend of inflation. And here you can say that this is uh, the long-term expectation of, uh, of future inflation, so that random O component of inflation, plus a component that is related to the output gap, so that this cyclical output and unemployment component, plus some kind of uh, energy price or some idiosyncratic component, okay? And uh, uh, you know this, uh, and then you know you uh, you can you can write this multivariate uh, system in this way, okay? So what we are doing is something a little bit more complicated because we have more data, we have lots, and you know all kind of stuff. So, but you know this is the essential idea. Um, so now on the hundred years of data, uh, we have uh, um, GDP, employment, unemployment, uh, CPI, core CPI, not for the old sample, so we, we do some, uh, uh, you know, missing observation techniques. So we have expected inflation also not for the old samples. Actually, we all, in what I showed, we also have uh, one-year interest rate. And... Uh, you know, if when you do this decomposition, I'm just now going to show you some pictures, okay? So, to, because uh, uh, I see some fatigues. Okay, when you, when, you take, when you take CPI inflation, this is the cyclical part. You can see in, uh, uh, you know, data from the beginning of the 20th century that there is a quite a regular component, which is the blue part, which is actually the output gap. So, this is a reduced form Phillips curve, okay? So it's not a structural Phillips curve, but I mean, it, it, this is just says that a time series model can pick up the cyclical component of inflation related to the slack in the economy, which is what originally Phillips had in mind. And then there is all this yellow stuff, which we model as an idiosyncratic cycle, but then it will turn out to be very much related to oil, okay? 
Now, the Phillips curve, once you denoise by the yellow, is very nice and steep, okay? This is on, uh, on 100 years on data. Now, uh, if you do something a bit more complex with more data on post-war data where we have uh, quarterly data expectations, all kind of stuff, which is a little bit more, uh, and where also policy is as likely to be more stable because, uh, uh, because you know, if you take 100 years, you have the gold standards, the Great Depression, the Fed was not independent until 51, we had Bretton Woods and so on. So if you look at now, this is so post-war and core inflation, you see very similar, very similar. Um, this is blue and yellow. And, uh, uh, and actually, uh, in the model, we also have the federal funds rate. You see that also the federal funds rate is very much, uh, 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 you know, has, uh, it loads, you know, clearly, uh, you know, this uh, business cycle component. But it has some yellow. And you see that this yellow is uh, particularly pronounced during the Volcker years, so that there is a, some idiosyncratic component that made the Fed to be more tight than in uh, histo historical regularities, and during the zero lo lower bound. More tight because there was constraint of the zero lower bound. Now, uh, here's the Phillips curve. Uh, so the red is when it is denoised, okay? And the blue is uh, when you just look at a correlation, okay? And so the, you know, the data are all over the place. Now, let's introduce a noise cycle. So now here we have, these are the variables, and uh, um, to, I have a business cycle for all these variables. I have the trends, but also I actually now have an oil cycle which low, uh, so that the GDP loads also on the oil cycle, employment, uh, and, and so on, okay? So that, uh, so, so uh, it does not load in the oil cycle, but the CPI loads on the, on the oil cycle, core loads on the oil cycle, expectation, the federal funds rate loads on the oil cycle. Now, these are quarterly observations, uh, pre-COVID. Now, the yellow is almost all filled in by this orthogonal oil cycle. So this is kind of to say, this is, uh, uh, all of you are probably too young, but in the 80s, uh, uh, you know, Robert Gordon was writing paper about the Phillips curve and the oil supply shocks. This is a way of uh, characterizing that view, okay, that the oil cycle is a sort of shifter of Phillips relations. And, uh, you know, this is, I mean, of course, uh, uh, we are imposing orthogonality as a way to, to extract the signal that, you know, we don't have to believe in pure orthogonality, but when you do that, actually, you can see that uh, that cycle, it's, uh, you know, it fills what uh, was the idiosyncratic. Um, so this is the CPI inflation. I mean, here you have also have the trend, of course, uh, you know, the trend we, we, uh, we extracted uh, by extracting the random walk component. And uh, here you have uh, actually the federal funds rate uh, in which there is very little red. So it looks like the federal funds rate does not really respond to oil historically. Uh, but, you know, the yellow of, uh, you know, the excessive uh, Volcker tightness and the tightness here is, uh, you know, uh, is exactly as it was before. Now, oh, okay, here you have a more, uh, now if you look at stability, now we do, okay, and, and I will finish with, uh, with few charts. Uh, um, if you look at stability uh, of this relationship, now we have the full sample, 60 to 84, 85 to 2019, 85 and 2007, the great moderation. It looks like uh, once you denoise and you detrend, uh, that the Phillips curve is much more stable than it has been uh, actually documented. Um, and uh, this is the rolling window estimation uh, with, uh, you know, you have an, uh, here the OLS model on uh, unemployment and inflation. This is our model, the red. Um, you see there is actually some flattening during the moderation, but it's not that uh, pronounced as, uh, as it has been found in other studies. If you try to understand uh, what actually, um, you know, digging in more about this instability uh, analysis here, you have the variance of the cycle by the different... Uh, um, the different, um, the different subsamples. The blue is the rate moderation. Indeed, the variance of the cycle was, uh, you know, as we know, the grade moderation is called the grade moderation because the variance of the cycle is lower, okay, than in the other subsamples. 
And if you look at the spectral density of the cycles, you can see also that, uh, you know, they are not always the same. And uh, here you have a, 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 lo a lower peak for the, for the, great, uh, for the great moderation. Uh, and of course, uh, you know, there, there are quite a lot of difference uh, in the spectral density of the energy cycle, I mean, which is not surprising given those descriptive charts I gave you at the beginning. But here, I mean, this something went wrong on this, uh, uh, on this, uh, on this chart. We are trying to decompose now the, uh, the instability which is driven by the loadings, so the coefficient, if you want, of uh, the output gap on inflation. And, uh, and then the, the, what comes out from, from the spectral density, you see that the loadings, the, sorry, that the loadings uh, are, um, are very, very stable. So it looks that uh, that kind of instability that we have seen in the variance and in the spectral density comes uh, from the shocks and not from uh, actually the, the, the correlations uh, between the, cor the, the loadings uh, between the, uh, the output gap and inflation which seems to suggest that the, uh, that kind of uh, different feature that we are seeing in the great moderation is mostly explained by the shocks, okay? But this is, you know, at, at this moment, it's just a conjecture. This is where we are trying to, uh, to go with this kind of, of, uh, of econometric framework, uh, which uh, is an old uh, apparatus, I mean, is an old, uh, you know, time series technique, structural time series models, uh, uh, pioneered by Andrew Harvey and others in the 70s. Uh, this is just uh, a larger scale and is uh, you know, estimated by Bayesian methods in order to, to cope with the dimensionality problems because the state space are quite heavy to handle. But uh, conceptually, these models are very simple and they match uh, quite nicely also to, to structural model. So uh, conclusion, uh, tentative reading of the data. Um, it seems that the Phillips curve is steep and stable after all. I mean, not completely, but uh, uh, some flattening during the great moderation driven by lower variance of the business cycle is itself explained by shocks rather than loadings. Business cycle component of inflation uh, um, seems to be, I mean, we have a kind of a toy structural model to try to understand uh, what is this business cycle component of inflation, this seems to be explained by the systematic response of monetary policy to, um, to business cycle. Um, oil uh, can be modeled as an orthogonal component uh, as in, uh, because that orthogonality comes uh, if interest rate does not uh, respond to oil as seems to come out from, from my evidence. You can show again with the toy model that then uh, this orthogonality in the reduced form is generated by this kind of policy behavior. And uh, with that, I finish. Okay. Excellent talk. Um, um, I guess we have a few minutes for uh, questions. Uh, let me open uh, the floor for questions. Uh, Davide. All right. Well, first of all, thanks for this very, very interesting talk and your offering your perspective on, on the behavior of inflation. Um, there is uh, uh, something that happened, you know, appeared in your conclusion to part one, but I I think uh, it, would, uh, it merits a bit more elaboration. That is, to what extent the different uh, uh, behavior of inflation in the US and in Europe, and also if we look at sectoral heterogeneity, could be attributed to fiscal policy. The fact that there was a very different intervention in the US and in Europe, and also we know that fiscal intervention per se uh, uh, operates differently in different sectors of the economy. Yeah, I mean, uh, okay, so if, if this were a policy audience, I would say fiscal policy is very important, but it's not in the model, <laughs> so that uh, I agree, so that fiscal policy to the extent that generates heterogeneity, uh, you know, it's uh, is also, you know, important, and I think uh, in both sense, because also fiscal policy just also uh, as an homogeneous shock, uh, has been much more supportive uh, in the U.S. than in the Euro area. And I think this goes a long way to explain why the trade-off between inflation and employment is much more favorable uh, in the U.S. Than, uh, than in the Euro area. So maybe the crazy Biden uh, fiscal stimulus was not so crazy after all. 
another dovish uh, <laughs> implication. I was wondering in your second exercise, if you would extend the sample up to the end of 2022, what would happen uh, with, the, with the oil? Because you ended in 2020. Yeah. Okay, we're not seeing precisely no, the part. We have it, we have it, but uh, uh, I decided to cut it because uh, I thought that this was an insane, you know, too many things and so on. So I, I can discuss it to you. So um, it, it may, you can do that kind of analysis only if you keep the parameters constant up to 2019 and then you estimate, uh, because otherwise uh, you don't understand it. So the model gets nuts, okay, crazy. That's, and uh, if you do that, uh, I, I, you know, I, uh, I should have uh, brought it. It, it actually confirms uh, very much the, you know, what the stylized fat that we have seen. Nothing really changes, okay? We see a lot of oil, of course, uh, at the end. But we also see that the output, this is the US, huh? so we see also that uh, the economy is strong, so there is a bit of blue as well, and then uh, and the interest rate responds to the blue. It's, it's important no, to take into account the, um, the sector heterogeneity and the, and the rigidity in terms of, of trade, uh, but um, to translate this in, uh, in terms of monetary policy and, the, and discussion about the, uh, the uh, the right monetary policy to carry, to carry out. Um, I don't know if you've tried to include something about uh, financial stability in the in the discussion, meaning not not just discussing causes of inflation and how to respond from a monetary policy point of view in terms of the of the inflation itself uh, due to real economy issues but also this layer of fiscal financial, financial stability. In the report, we have, uh, uh, you know, as you notice, uh, this report is written by three academics and one chief economist like you, and the last chapter, it's, uh, it's very much, uh, uh, you know, about these kind of issues and also about uh, the long-term interest rate and so on. And uh, uh, actually what, what we have seen is that uh, one other pe peculiarity of this inflation is that uh, we have seen much more tight credit spreads than in other, uh, than in other in, uh, disinflation episodes, so that the financial sector has been relatively resilient. And um, so not only the labor market uh, has been resilient, but also the financial sector has been resilient. Now, this is probably due to fiscal policy, okay? So, and then we have some measures uh, for the U.S. of the role of transfers uh, and, uh, and bankruptcy, especially. So that uh, bankruptcy, there have been very, very few bankruptcies uh, relative to other business cycle episodes of this kind. And uh, bankruptcy and unemployment is very much related, and this is also related to, you know, the, the balance sheet, uh, non-performing loans, and so on. So the fiscal support uh, has given resilience to the U.S. economy, and therefore financial stability, I mean, we have seen episodes of financial instability in the U.S., but actually these are completely idiosyncratic, uh, you know, episodes linked to, to very poor risk management uh, uh, from some banks, and they have been solved quite quickly by Federal, uh, Federal Reserve intervention. Now, for the euro area, I wouldn't be so uh, sure that uh, if the current tightening uh, uh, continues, uh, then maybe we can see things, uh, uh, you know, in the future, because, uh, uh, you know, if you look at the ECB lending survey, uh, we have seen a big deterioration of, uh, of lending uh, conditions, and therefore, you know, we may see it coming. But, you know, banks are much more capitalized than they have been in the past and so on, so there is a buffer. Okay, any other questions? Excuse me. Uh, uh, one exercise that uh, part of the narrative of the origins of inflation was this shift from services to manufacturing. To what? To manufacturing, to manufacturing. Yeah. And I don't know whether you did this exercise in, in, your, in your report of saying what the effect on oil check, but at the same time, things are moving from services, demand is moving from services to manufacture, manufacturers, given that they have different price rigidities. And div no, I mean, the idea is that uh, uh, if prices uh, 
do, if relative prices do not move enough, uh, then the reallocation to services uh, is not fast enough. And that, uh, uh, and uh, so, I mean, this is, a, this is the story. So uh, I think what is missing, so, you know, so, the, the, so the, there is not enough movement, uh, okay, in quantities because prices uh, uh, are not moving uh, enough. So because, because of tight, if, if, if monetary policy is too tight, okay, so that's the idea. Now, uh, what, we, what we don't have, and I think it would be nice to have, uh, is to have an empirical you know, evidence uh, on when this reallocation effect has, has, has worked itself throughout the economy, because that would give us an idea of uh, you know, how much reallocation there is still have to take place okay, in the economy. Uh, there's a, a paper from the National Bureau of Economic Research. They estimate two Phillips curves, one uh, prices uh, with regards to a marginal cost and one from marginal cost to regards to the labor market. And they find some, some similar findings that the relationship between marginal cost and price has been stable. What has broken down is the relationship between the product, the output gap, and the, lab, and the marginal cost in the sense that um, labor market shocks has not, have not been transmitted uh, as uh, pressures in wages to, to the costs. One possible explanation would be uh, the lowering of the bargaining power of workers. Looking at the paper, another explanation that may come to, to mind is that the marginal cost is much more related to the oil than to the, to, to the labor market itself in the sense that this is because it's responding to oil variations rather than labor market variations. But this interpretation would be at odds with evidence that we've, been, we've become more efficient in how to use the energy. We need less units of oil per output than we needed 50 years ago. So how to conciliate these this, this views, these this stylized facts? Well, I mean, uh, uh, we may be more efficient, uh, but, uh, uh, okay, so I think that, uh, you know, the model is stylized so that uh, you just need uh, one sector to use, uh, to be a direct user of oil and another sector to be an indirect user of oil. That's all you need, plus the rigidity, okay? Um, so I think for the story, the fact that we have become more efficient, uh, uh, it doesn't really matter. It matters uh, uh, whether we are producer or importers, and that's the difference between the closed economy and the open economy. Uh, now, wages, uh, I, I, I haven't understood your point, I mean, that, that, but I think it goes in my direction, right, that wages is not the mechanism. No, because there is also related research on, uh, by Lorenzoni and Werning uh, on, uh, on, uh, on, on wage profit uh, bargaining, so that uh, you could actually include something like that in this framework, a very similar model. So actually, Veronica is even the wife of, of, uh, of, uh, of one of the other, of the other people. So the models are very similar. But uh, so you can complicate the model and put something a little bit more complicated on labor market and put, uh, for example, non sustainability between labor and oil and so on, or more sustainability between labor and oil. And, but, yeah, it seems that uh, this paper that uh, I haven't read, you know, is compatible with, yeah. Okay, so if there are no more questions, uh, let's thank uh, Lucrezia again.